Welcome to the first half of the Working with Tread Grass videos. Here we will cover all the vertical transformations. Last time, in the intro to Trig video, we briefly covered who I am and what this series is about, and then went on to recap the Nat4 Trig content. We recalled the right angle triangle definition and revised Sokotoa using it to do two examples. We then looked at how we could use this triangle definition to get the Trig graphs, and then went on to demonstrate a more intuitive way to get the graphs from the unit circle, which we'll start with today. The video ended with justifying why we care about Trig at all, both in terms of using right angle triangles and then talking about how we can use Trig functions to model waves. If you want to look at, have a look at this in more depth, the link to this intro video will be in the description. And now let's get on to what this video will cover. Let's have a look at this so-called unit circle. If we set the hypotenuse of this triangle equal to 1, then the side opposite the angle theta, theta is just a variable we use for angles instead of x sometimes, then the side opposite the angle theta is sine theta, and the side adjacent to the angle is cos theta. If you want to see how this works in a little bit more detail, have a look in the last video, but for now, let's just see how we can use it as a starting point to get the graphs. Here is a little animation that shows how we get the graphs from just taking a point around the circle. You can see the sign is just plotting out the vertical displacement from the middle, and cause is doing the same, but for the horizontal displacement. And we go all the way around from zero to 360 degrees. We'll take a quick look at an animation on a maths and geometry website called GeoGebra to see how the graphs are plotted and also how we can get the tan graph from this unit circle definition. Here we are on GeoGebra and if I turn on the sign tracking you can see that it just plots sign as the vertical displacement how far away it is from the middle as it goes around the circle and starting from zero you can see that it traces out the usual sign curve and it just repeats itself after 360 degrees because there's only 360 degrees in a circle. If I turn on cause, you can show it does the exact same thing, except this time it traces out the horizontal displacement. I won't talk about this too much here, because I'll leave this in the description for you to play about, play about with, but I do want to show how tan is defined from the unit circle. If you turn it on, it's defined a little bit strangely, but it's the height of the tangent to the circle as we go down the circle. Now we're back, remember, you don't need to know where the graphs come from or how the unit circle works. I just think that it makes it more interesting and also easier to remember what they look like. But you just need to know how to draw them. So let's draw them. Starting with sine, we'll get our graph ready. We'll plot on y equals sine x. And remember the maximum is 1 and the minimum is minus 1. And noting that the circle is 360 degrees, this is why we plot the graphs from 0 to 360 degrees. Okay, so wait for the circle to get back around to zero. Now I'll plot it at the same time just to make sure it creates the same shape. Here we go. And you'll notice that indeed the sign graph is the same as plotted out in the animation there. And we can do the exact same for cause. So let's get our cause graph ready. And plot out from zero to 360 again. Noting again the maximum and minimum is one and minus one. And then we'll wait for the circle to get round back to the start and we'll start tracing out the cause graph. And again, you can see it does plot out the same, the correct shape just from the animation. And now we're going to do the tan graph. And we'll get it from a slightly different animation. We'll get it from this one. But remember, we covered it on GeoGebra and it's just defined as the tangent, the height of the tangent to the circle. Don't worry too much about the, the fact this is in pi and 2 pi. It's in radians, which is just a different way of measuring angle. You'll cover it next year. But it's it basically, this is 180 and this is 360. And you'll see that it plots out the same. Is what we covered before. So let's plot our tan graph. And we don't include the amplitude this time because it actually shoots up to infinity, as you can see. But we'll plot it from 0 to 360 as before. And as you see, it plots the exact same shape as it does in animation. And we'll bring all three graphs side by side because I want to talk about amplitudes. So the amplitude is defined as the distance between the middle of the graph. And the top of the graph, which in this case here is 1, or the bottom of the graph and the middle of the graph, which is also 1. So we'll write down that the amplitude here is 1. Now it can also be defined as half the distance from the top to the bottom, which means here the amplitude is the distance between top and bottom is 2, so we divide that by 2. And again it's 1, it's, it's an equivalent definition, but this one might be a bit more useful when we come across more complicated graphs because it's sometimes hard to tell what the middle of the graph is, but it's quite 
quite obvious where the top and the bottom is. Okay, let's work out what it is for cause here. So for cause, let's use the second definition that we came across. Let's go for the distance between the top and the bottom, which is 2. Which means that the amplitude is half that distance, which as you can see, it's 1 as well. And this is because um, at the start of each of the functions, there's no number, which means it's basically just a 1. And the number in front determines the amplitude, but we'll go on to that in a second. Now for tan, I've not written anything on here because as you can see, the amplitude, the, the graph goes shooting up. So there is no maximum on the graph. It goes up to infinity. So here we say that the amplitude, I'll just say amp for short, is undefined. Let's look at how the graphs can change vertically. So we can move the graphs up and down here by 1. And this is what's called a vertical translation because we're translating it from one place to another. Or we can also do a vertical stretch. Here we stretch it by 2. And we can also do a compression. And we'll compress it down to a half. And these are the two ways in which we can graphs can change vertically. And we can also do a horizontal translation or shift. Shift is another word for translation. As well as a horizontal stretch slash compression. But we'll focus on them next video. And now we'll go on to look at the general form of the trig functions to see how these transformations might come about. So the general form includes three layers that weren't there before. And these all affect the function in different ways. The red A corresponds to the amplitude that we spoke about before. So if A equals 2, the amplitude is 2. And it corresponds to a vertical stretch or compression, depending on the number. The blue B affects the period of the function, and it corresponds to a horizontal stretch or compression, and we'll talk about this next time. And adding or taking a number off the end, which is C here, just corresponds to moving the graph up or down, which is a vertical shift or translation, as I spoke about earlier. And you'll notice that the numbers outside of the functions, outside the signs, so in this case A and the C, both affect the vertical thing. So that means that if it's outside, it corresponds to something vertical. And if it's inside, like this B here, if it's inside, it corresponds to something horizontal. And that will be covered in the video next time. So let's look at the amplitude in more detail. So I just said that the amplitude is only affected by the number in front, which is the A's here. And as you can see, these numbers haven't changed in these graphs. They're all just ones, essentially. So this means the amplitude shouldn't change. And as we can see here, the distance between the bottom and the top for all the graphs is 2. And if you have that, um, you get an amplitude of 1 for both. And we can show it for the middle one here, just by going from the middle to the top. And remember, for the middle to the top, you just count it as the whole thing. So all these graphs on the left here are an amplitude of 1. And that's because the A in front is 1 for all of them. Whereas on the right here, when we did the stretches, the numbers in front of the graphs changed. So here, because A equals 2, it got stretched by 2, and it actually reached up to height of 2 now. And down to the bottom, minus 1, and eh, minus 2. And you can see that the difference between the top and the bottom is now 4, which means, I'll do a little arrow, which means that the amplitude for the big purple one is 4 over 2, which is 2 now. So the amplitude has changed to 2. And for the 0 0.5, the amplitude is halved, so it will be only 0 0.5 high. So this guy here is only 0 0.5 on its max. And at its minimum, it's negative 0 0.5. And you can see the distance between the middle and the top is 0 0.5, and distance between the bottom and the top is 1, and you half that, you get an amplitude of 0 0.5 again. Let's go on a program called Desmos to look at this in a little bit more detail. Here we are in Desmos, and we're using our graphing calculator to show the different cos curves. So we'll put on our 2 cos x and our 0 0.5 cos x like before, and you can see they look the same as they did. And we can also add on any other curve we want, so let's put on 3 cos x, or we could even put on a 0 0.3 cos x. But the reason this is useful is because we can add a slider, and we can see that, for the now, red one's the same as regular cos x, but if we make it bigger than 1, then the graph does indeed stretch. So if a is bigger than 1, it's a stretch. And if a goes less than 1, then it compresses, and it shrinks down, and we can go all the way down to 0 0.1, and then 0. 
and zero disappears because zero times anything is zero. But we can keep going past zero and we can go negative and we can see that it just goes smoothly through the axis. And if we go to minus one, we can see that it's it's the same amplitude as the regular closed curve. They're both one higher in the middle, so they're both going to amplitude of one. Except it's flipped about the x-axis, it's reflected to the next axis. And we can also do the same for negative 2 here, we can go up to negative 2, and we see that it's the same height, same size as 2 cos x, but it's just flipped. Let's summarise what we found. A is the, the amplitude is just the distance from the middle to the max, or the minimum, or half the distance from the bottom to the top. If the magnitude, they lines mean magnitude, so it just means ignore the sign, if the number itself is bigger than 1, then it's a stretch, like if A equals 2. If the magnitude of A is less than 1, then it's compression, like if A is a half. Or we can also get the case where A itself is negative, which means that we need to do a flip and then a stretch of compression. And if we do A equals minus 2, it stretches by 2, but it's also flipped about the x-axis. Let's look at vertical shifts. So we won't go in decimals here, because this one's a little bit more obvious, but it will be in the description if you want to look at it. But you can see that adding or subtracting a number at the end just results in moving up or down, depending if it's positive or negative. Plus 1 means move up, minus 1 means move it down. Both by one. On the right here, you can see that we're not adding or taking away anything of the function outside of it. So this means, and we can see that it still goes through the axis at the same point, which means it's not being shifted up and down at all. So it's only in adding or subtracting a number on the end here that we get a vertical shift. Let's summarize this. So here, the C is just how much it's been shifted up or down by. If it's positive, we move it up. So, for example, if c is positive 1, we move it up by 1. And if it's negative, we move it down. So, if c is negative 1, we move it down by 1. And that's the two types of vertical transformations. We'll go through examples, combining both in our examples video. And we'll round off this video with, why do we care about this at all? There's applications to loads of everyday physical phenomena. So, any time you have some sort of system where something's oscillating, for example, this lovely little individual on a swing, then the distance they are from the middle of the swing, call it y, can be given by this trig relationship between the angle. So we can write it in terms of sine of the angle. And the amplitude of the swing, this thing here, is just how long the swing is. So for example, if the swing was, I don't know, 2.5 metres long, is that how long the swing is? It is now. Then this guy here is 2.5. And the classic physics, physics example is something like a bob, so it's a little thing on the string and it just oscillates back and forth. And any time you have some sort of system where there's like a basic oscillation, you'll frequently find trig's a good way to model it. Beyond oscillations, trig can unsurprisingly also model objects that go in circular motion, like this wind turbine here. If it goes around a circle, we can use a trig function to model the height of the blades as it goes round. This time it'd be cos. And if we want it to, to make, if we look at this angle here as it goes round, then if the blades are more than a metre long, let's say they're two metres, then we need to multiply this whole thing by two, so the amplitude becomes two. And if it's also already 20 metres off the ground, then we need to add that on. And that shows how our two vertical transformations can be applied to something physical. Beyond that, amplitude of an electromagnetic wave, so like light, is related to its energy. The amplitude of a sound wave is related to its volume, and the amplitude related to, is related to voltage on an oscilloscope. And if that's not interesting enough, you'll be covering general grasp transformations next year. So stuff like y equals x squared going to 2x squared minus 4 maybe. And we also get general graphs, such as a function f of x, going to transforming like something like this. This brings us to the end of our vertical transformations video. This one was a little bit longer because I wanted to show where the graphs come from as well as how they transform vertically. The next one on horizontal transformations should be shorter. And after that there will be a video on just going through examples like the one shown. So maybe have a go at them before you watch the examples video. And we'll also go through some exam style questions.